So today we are going to cover six, section 6.8, which is covering what's called piecewise functions. Okay, because sometimes when you're looking at a graph, it's not the same uh, function all the way across. Sometimes it could be a straight or a horizontal line for a little bit of it, and then it could jump into a parabola upside down, and then into a line with a positive slope. So those are gonna be what's called piecewise functions because depending on where you are along the x-axis, what piece of the graph that you would be get, <clears throat> talking about, okay? So we're gonna be doing 6.8 and I'm gonna kind of jump around in it. I'm gonna do one, two, and three first, and then I'm gonna jump to nine, I mean 10 and 11 because they seamlessly go right after one, two, and three. So let's look at number one. It's going to give you a function that actually has three different pieces or parts. So the function is f of x equals or x minus one for when x is less than negative five, three x for when negative five is less than or equal to x, which is less than two. And the last piece is x squared for when x is greater than or equal to two. So before we do anything else, let's just think about the x-axis just being a regular run-of-the-mill number line, okay? So on a number line, let's look at these numbers that are represented in my pieces. For instance, negative five is represented and two is represented. So negative five on the number line would be here, which positive two would be here. Okay, so let's look at where this piece would be. X is less than negative five. Well, here's negative five on the number line. If you are less than it, then you are in that piece right there, right? That's where all the numbers less than negative five would be. This X kind of represents the numbers between negative five and positive two, which would be right in that area. This last piece represents for when X is greater than or equal to two, which would be all the numbers on that side of two. So let's see what it says. It says identify the expression that should be used to find F of negative three. So where would negative three come in on this number line? Negative three, let's see if zero is here, right? Because then your positive numbers come this way, your negative numbers come this way. Negative three would be right there, okay? So forget about that zero, but where is negative three? It's in between the negative five and the positive two. So it's in this piece right here between negative five and two, which means I would use the three X part of the graph to find f of negative three. So again, let me just walk through this. You've got your three parts. I'm gonna put the two numbers that are represented in those three parts on the number line. So negative five and two were the numbers represented. And then it's gonna tell me in the problem, it's gonna say, okay, find where negative three falls in this number line. Well, negative three is just a little bit to the right of negative five. So there's where negative three would fall on the number line, which means it falls in between negative five and two. So I come back up here in my parts and I say, okay, which section says between where X is between negative five and two? It's this section right here, which means three X is where you would find the negative three. 
Okay, numbers two and three are just like this. So if it wasn't clear on this one, let's look at these next two. They're the same exact kind of problems. All right, number two, my function is 4x for when x is less than negative 5, x minus 8 for when negative 5 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 3, and x squared for when x is greater than or equal to positive three. So again, I like to see the representation on the number line. The number line is representing the x-axis because that's what, that's all the x-axis is, is it's, it's a number line. So what's represented? Negative five and positive three are represented. All the numbers below negative five would be this way. Between negative five and positive three would just be in between those. And the numbers greater than three are that direction. So this time it wants me to find the expression that should be used to find f of positive 15. So where would positive 15 be on the number line? Well, if this is positive three. My numbers get more positive going this way. So 15 would be somewhere down there, right? Which means this, where, where is this section represented? All the numbers greater than three are this section right here, right? X is greater than or equal to positive three, which is where 15 falls, right? 15 is greater than three. So what part of the graph would I use to find F of 15? x squared. Okay, number three. Again, same kind of question. This time, f of x is x minus 7 for when x is less than negative 2, 6x for when negative 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 3. And then the last piece is x squared for when x is greater than or equal to three. So there's my three pieces. Let's see what that looks like on the number line. My numbers are negative two and positive three. We run into something a little different that we haven't seen. This says, identify the expression that should be used to find f of three. So when I look at this, I say, oh, well, three is on the number line. It's actually represented in two of the pieces. But what does this one say? This one says X is less than three. Well, there's my X. It's not less than three. It equals three, right? Three is not less than three. Three equals three. This one says X is greater than or equal to. So you're looking for the one that has that equal to bar. So since this one has the equal to bar, I'm using its piece to find F of three. So I use this piece, which means I would use what part of the graph? The X squared part of the graph. Okay. Now, we are gonna jump around because numbers nine and 10, wait, no, 10 and 11, actually just seamlessly come after these. They're just numbers 10 and 11 are just gonna take this one 
step further. Once you find the piece that the number goes in, like we found that the three went into this bottom piece, which was X squared, you're actually gonna plug it into that piece. Let me show you what I'm talking about on number 10. There's only two pieces to this graph. G of X equals X plus nine for when X is less than or equal to three and six minus X for when X is greater than three. So there's only two pieces, right? This one only has two parts. Three is the only number I need to see represented because if you are less than or equal to three, so anything to the left of three, all the numbers below three or equal to three go in this X plus nine part. All the numbers greater than three, which means all the numbers bigger than three go in the six minus X Part. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. The first thing it wants me to find is G of negative six. So the first thing you're going to do is, okay, where is negative six? Is it below three or above three? If it's below three, it goes in this part. If it's above three, it goes in this part. Well, negative six is below three, right? It's less than three. So what part does it go in? It goes in this X plus nine part. Now here's where this one takes it one step further. It says, okay, you found the part that negative six goes in. So plug it in there. So once you find the piece, you're just gonna replace that X with the negative six. So I'll have negative six plus nine, which gives me positive three. All right, we're on the same problem. Second part, it wants me to find G of three. So once again, three is the number that's represented on this number line. So I wanna come up here and find the piece of that that says X equals three, because I wanna know where to put it when it is three. So this one says greater than three, which we are not. We are not greater than three. We are three. This one says less than or equal to. There's my equal to bar that I'm looking for, which means what part does this go in? Again, it goes in the X plus nine part. And again, now that we're taking it that one extra step, this three goes in the X plus the nine to get 12. And then the last one, G of seven. So let's see what part does seven fall into? It's not less than or equal to three, it's greater than three, right? Seven's bigger than three. So it comes into this part, which is six minus X. Once I find the part, then I plug the seven in for that X. So I'll have six minus seven, which gives me negative one. Okay, I'm gonna do number 11. It's the same exact thing. We're gonna find the piece that the number goes in and then we're gonna plug it into that piece.
h of x equals negative 4x minus 9 when x is less than negative 6. It's just plain old 5 for when negative 6 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 5. And the last part is x plus 2 for when x is greater than or equal to 5. So let's see on the number line. My numbers are negative 6 and positive 5. Those are the two numbers that separate my number line into three different parts. So let's see, the first question it asked me is find h of negative eight. So let's see, on the number line, where would negative eight be? If this is negative seven, remember you get more negative going this way. This would be negative seven, or excuse me, if that's negative six, then right to the left of it's negative seven, there would be negative eight, right? You're getting more negative as you come this way on the number line. So your negative eight is in this part right here. So where is less than negative six? So negative eight is less than negative six. So what part does it go in? Negative four X minus nine. So now that I know what part it goes in, I've replaced this one's x. I put that negative 8 in its spot. So negative 4 times negative 8 minus 9. So negative 4 times negative 8 is positive 32. Minus 9 and 32 minus 9 gives me 23. Right, the next thing it wants me to find is what is H of two? So let's look at my number line. Where would two be? Let's see, negative six. Then let's see, there's four, three, two. So two would be right there. So in between negative six and five, which is represented in this middle part, right? X is in between the negative six and the positive five. So look at its piece. When I come over here and say, okay, two would be in between there. Look at its piece. It is just plain old five. There's not even an X to plug in. If you are in between negative six and positive five, then your answer is all, every single answer for those problems is just five. All right, H of five. Again, when you run into one of the numbers that's actually on your number line that you represented, it's gonna be in two spots, right? So I'm looking for the one that equals five. So this bottom one is the one that has the equal bar, right? Because five is what I'm looking for, which means I need to find equals five, which is this bottom one. So what's its piece? X plus two. So this time, since there was an X to plug into, I got to plug into it, right? I put the five in that X spot. So if I do that, I have five plus two, which gives me seven. And my last one, H of eight. So let's see. Where does eight fall? Eight would be above five. So it's in this last piece right here, X, where eight is greater than five. So it also uses the X plus two part. So I'm replacing its X with an eight. So I have eight plus two, which gives me 10.
okay? Now, we are gonna go back to number four. We're gonna see visually what these piecewise functions look like on a graph. And then we're gonna talk about the intervals on whether they are decreasing on that part, whether they're constant, which means going straight across, or whether they're increasing, which means their Y values are going up. So I'm going to recreate as best I can number four. Okay, so here's what number four looks like. Now, before I do anything, it's gonna ask me where it's increasing, decreasing, and constant. I'm actually going to label where all this is happening. So if you are decreasing, you are going down. Your Y values are going down like this. If you are constant, you're horizontal. You're just gonna go straight across. If you are increasing, you are going to go up from the left to the right, or in other words, your Y values are what are increasing, going up. So let's label this. This one, since it's going down, that's gonna be an area that is decreasing. This area where it's just going straight left to right, or in other words, it's horizontal, that's your constant area. And then this last interval or area, it's increasing because it's got the Y values are traveling up. So this is an increase. Now, the second thing I'm going to do before I start talking about the intervals of each one of these is go to each point where there is a change where it stops doing one thing and starts doing the next thing. For instance, right here, it stops decreasing and starts being constant. And I am just going to write down next to this point, it's X coordinate. And the reason is when you are talking about the intervals on which the graph is increasing or decreasing or constant, you use the X coordinate. So that's why I'm not gonna write down the Y coordinate because I don't wanna confuse myself. So let's see, this point where there is a change in direction. Let's see, this lines up with the X axis at positive, oh, not positive, negative three. And this one lines up, that's the next change of direction with the X axis at positive three. So now that I have those two points, which are my change in directions, label. Let's also not forget that the x-axis goes forever this way to negative infinity and forever to the right to positive infinity. So the first thing it's gonna say is the function is increasing on what interval? So now that I've actually labeled everything, I just look for my increase interval, which is just this one right here, right? It says increase on it. That's my increase. And I say where it stops, I mean, excuse me, where it starts to where it stops. So where does it start to increase? That's why I wrote this number down. You use the X coordinate of where it starts the process. So it starts to increase at positive three, we use parentheses talking about increasing and decreasing. I'll explain that in a second. So it starts in at three. And then the arrow going to the right means it's increasing 
all the way to infinity. And infinities always have parentheses. The reason the three has a parenthesis, because what does a parenthesis mean? It means don't include the three. I'm actually not including the three, because if you included the three, or would you be including it with the constant or with the increase? It's actually not in either one. It's where it stops doing one thing and is about to start doing the other. So again, that's why you use parentheses on the increase and decrease questions instead of brackets. So it increases from three to infinity. Let's see, the next thing it says is where is it constant? So where does it start? Here's my constant. So where does it start being constant? Again, I've already labeled it, negative three. Where does it stop being constant? Positive three. And the last thing it's gonna ask you is where is it decreasing? Well, here's my decrease interval. Where does it start decreasing? Well, this means it's forever going to the left that way. So it starts decreasing at negative infinity all the way until it gets to what? That point right there, which is negative three. Okay, all right, number five. I recreated this one a lot better than I can recreate number five. So hopefully you have your sheet printed off and you can follow along and look at your sheet. All right, I'm gonna give it my best shot. So on these, remember when you are looking at a graph where the lines are that close together on Math Lab, remember it's going to have a little magnifying glass up here that you can click on, especially on this problem right here. You're going to want to click on that magnifying glass so you can make it easier to see where those points are. Okay, so there's my best recreation for number five. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go right in each section, whether it's constant, increasing, or decreasing. 
So this one, constant. When it's going from up from the left to the right, that's an increase. Then this one is going down, so that one's a decrease. And up again, so another increase. Now, again, I'm going to go to each of these points and tell what its X coordinate is. So again, if you have yours, that's why you're going to want to use the magnifying glass to make that big on when you're in math lab. Let's see, this one's X coordinate is a negative nine because it's lined up with that negative nine on the X axis. This one's lined up with with negative five, so that's its X. This one's also lined up with negative five, so that's its X. This one is lined up with positive two, and the that one right next to it's lined up on the X axis with positive three. This one is lined up with positive five. And that one's lined up with positive eight. So again, go through to every single point where there is a change in direction and put its X coordinate. So that way, when we get to actually answering the questions, we're literally just looking at what we have written down. The first one wants to know is where is it increasing? When I look at the increase, I actually see two intervals. This one's it got an increase on it. And this one has an increase on it. So, and again, I already have them labeled, right? Where is this one increasing from? Negative five until it gets to positive two. So there's the first increase. Here's the second increase. It's increasing from positive five until it gets to positive eight. Then it wants to know where it is decreasing. So which one did we write decrease on? This interval right here. So where does it start decreasing? Right here at that three. And it goes down and decreases until it gets to the five. And the last part of the question says, okay, where is it constant? Well, this little interval right here, it starts to be constant at negative nine all the way until it gets to negative five. So there's where it is constant. All right, number six. Again, to the best of my ability,
Okay, so again, this is a piecewise function because remember when we were doing those first problems where part of the graph was an x squared, that one uh, number. On this one, on number 11, remember where a piece of it was just a five? That's, that's, that's a constant piece, right? All the numbers in between there are gonna have, they, they all go with the same value, okay? This is an, this is an increase and another constant. Now let's see, what's happening here? The values are going up, so there's an increase. Until it gets to this point, because what does it start doing after this point? It starts going down. So there's a decrease. And then a horizontal, so there's a constant. And then another little area of increase. And then the final area is another horizontal, so constant. Let's label the X coordinates of each of the points where it changes directions. This one it increases until it gets to here. So that's negative one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll sign up with negative seven. Let's see at this point, negative one, two, three, four, five. So this one's lined up with negative five. This one's lined up with negative two. That one's lined up with, where to put it? Negative one. So let's see, it wants to know where it is increasing. So there's two increases, right? This increase, and then also this increase. So let's start with this one. Where does it start increasing? What does the arrow to the left tell me? That it starts to increase at negative infinity all the way until it gets to this point, because at that point, that's where it's gonna change directions and decrease. So it increases until it gets to that negative seven. So that takes care of that increase. Here's my other increase. So this one starts increasing at negative two and it increases just until it gets to that negative one. So it increases from negative two to negative one. Then it wants to know where it's decreasing. Increase, there's a decrease, constant, increase, constant. So this is the only decrease. And I have them labeled again. So I'm, I mean, excuse me, decreasing from negative seven until I get to negative five. And then the last thing it wants to know is on what intervals is your graph constant, which means horizontal. So I want to talk about this interval right here, and then also this one right here. So from negative five to negative two is the first constant. And then it starts to be constant again right here, which is negative one. And then it's constant forever that way. So from negative one to positive infinity. Right, number seven.
right, on number seven, I'm not gonna draw all the hash marks because it literally tells you the important point, that point right there where it changes directions. And it says it's at 6.5, 3.25. Now this one asks a couple of different questions. It's gonna talk about whether or not this graph has what's called a relative maximum or minimum. And we've talked about this before. Remember, this is the vertex of that parabola. If the vertex is at the top of the parabola, that's gonna be its maximum height, right? Its maximum is the very top of it. So this one has a, re a relative maximum. And then it's gonna say the relative maximum occurs at x equals blank and has value blank. So remember, when you're talking about the value of a point, you're talking about its y coordinate. That's always gonna give you what the value number of the point is, okay? And it kind of gives you a clue on which of these numbers to put where, because it literally says the maximum occurs at x equals blank. Well, there's my x, there's my y. So my X is 6.5 and has value. Remember, value is always referring to the Y coordinate of the point, which is 3.25. So that's the new part. And then it also wants to know is where is the graph increasing and where is it decreasing? So same as what we've been doing. My Y values are going up, 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 up until they hit this point, And then they're going down, 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 down. So they're increasing on this side. Then once they pass through the vertex or the maximum, then they start to decrease. Okay, and I already know what the point is. It tells me in the problem. So remember, you're using that x, that x coordinate of that point. So it's increasing. If it's on the left, it means it starts at negative infinity, increases until it gets to 6.5, which is the same point where it starts to do what? Where it starts to decrease. So I'm starting to decrease at 6.5. And if the arrow is going to the right, that means it increases to positive infinity. All right, number eight. Number eight is going to be just like this number seven was, but it's going to have a maximum and a minimum on its graph. Okay, so it goes like this, and then it tells you where these two points are located. It says this one is at negative seven, negative one, and this one's at negative three, negative nine. So, it's going to ask where the maximum is and the minimum. The maximum is at the top of the hill. The minimum is at the bottom of the hill. So this one is its maximum. Here's its minimum. So this one says, 
says its maximum is blank at x. equals blank and its minimum is blank at x equals blank. So remember when it's talking about the maximum or the minimum, it's talking about the value. Then the maximum minimum occurs at x equals blank. So what is its maximum value? Its maximum value is always its y coordinate. So it's maximum is negative one and it occurs where x is negative seven. Same thing with the minimum, talking about the minimum value. The minimum value is negative nine and it occurs at x equals negative three. And again, it wants to know the increasing intervals. So let's see what's happening here. My Y values are going up until it gets to the maximum. So this is an increase. Until it gets to this point, it decreases in that little spot between the two points. So there's your decrease. And then as soon as it gets to that minimum, it goes back up. So there's actually another increase on this side of the minimum. So where does the increase? There's two increases, this interval and then this interval. So I want to talk about those two intervals when I'm talking about increasing. Where does this one start its increase? All the way to the left. So it starts at negative infinity. And it increases until it gets to what? Remember, which one of these coordinates do you use when you're talking about increasing and decreasing? The X. So it increases until it gets to negative seven. And then it goes down for a little bit. And then it starts increasing again here, which is where X is negative three. And it increases forever to positive infinity. And last part, where is it decreasing? Just on that one little spot in between the max and min. So where does it start decreasing? Negative seven and it decreases until it gets to negative three. All right, last one, number nine. All right, number nine just wants to know where the relative maximum and minimum are. And it doesn't label the points, but it does make them pretty clear. These will be a lot more clear, right? How the hash marks are farther apart and the points are pretty clear where they are. So let's label this point with its coordinates because if you're wanting to know what the maximum is, you're gonna to wanna to know what its value is and the X where it occurs. So let's see, this point, I don't go left or right at all, so my X is zero. I go up one, which means my Y of one. And this point is its minimum. So it's X, looks like it's lined up with the two, 
for the X. And it looks like it's lined up with negative three for the Y. So there's its coordinates. So let's see the maximum, which is the top of the hill. The maximum is what? What is the maximum value? The maximum is one and it occurs at X equals zero. Same thing for the minimum. The minimum is, what's the minimum value? The minimum is negative three and it occurs at X equals two. Okay. All right. So that's all we're going to cover today. We're just going to get through 6.8.